Are you ready for a word today of God? So how about if we declare it then and we confess it? You're going to have it on the screens. Let's make our declaration of faith all together. Please here in the temple and at home. Let's say all together. Lord, I am ready to hear your word. I'm ready to believe your word and to leave your word because I've been chosen for victory and not for defeat. For health and not for sickness. Come on, mean it. For prosperity and not for poverty because I am more than a conqueror in Jesus' name and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And if you believe that, praise Jesus right there as you're sitting down this morning. We are, as uh, we've been mentioning, entering the third week of our fasting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, for that, uh, it's, it's, it's always interesting, fasting season. It's always good, man. God always starts revealing things inside of us as we are searching for him. Remember, fasting is not a magical formula. It's just a conscient one that you come and you say, I'm going to say no to this so I can say yes to God. And that's really what it is, right? And uh, I know God's doing some incredible things in your life. And if you don't feel like that, I feel you too. I know that sometimes it's like, I don't get it right, or you broke your fast, or this is not working. It's not about working. It, it, it's about getting close to God. And if you have achieved that, then you have success in your, you have, you have, Acquire success in your, in your journey as you're fasting. So don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Actually, take heart and keep on going. Amen. One more week. Let's go. Woo. Okay, I'm the only one excited about the last week. Okay, my coffee's waiting for me on the other side of the, the next week. Okay, all right, that's good. <laughs> I'm excited, and uh, I love the, the whole theme behind our fasting, Open Your Eyes. And I think that's exactly uh, 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 such a meaningful prayer when we come before God and we say, can you open my eyes, please? Because I want to see things that I might be missing. And actually, God, I want to see things like you see things. I think so many, oftentimes, we go through life, and we, through life and we see things, but we don't necessarily see the things that God is seeing in the midst of that. And that's what we call perspective, right? Uh, we've been praying for you. We've been praying for ourselves that God can give us a fresh perspective on life, that God can see things can show us things that we cannot see. Amen. I don't know about, about you, but that's a great prayer to pray. And um, uh, I want to show you a picture as we start today. Uh, can, can you shout out? And in the chat, you can shout out, like, in a, in, a, in a word or a phrase, what do you see there in the picture? An iceberg. Very well, yeah. That is an iceberg, indeed. Uh, anything. What, 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 what vibe gives you? Okay, let me say it like that. What, what yes. Small on the top. Uh, big on the bottom. Okay, that's that's good. Anybody else? I, I I can't see the chat right now, but you can write what you see on that picture. One, one more. Yes, yes. Cold. Cold. Yes. There's more underneath. It's shallow. You say that's very interesting. I I I want to say what I want to tell you what I see in the picture in a phrase. Okay. Uh, I see in that picture that in life there's there's more than meets the eye. So dramatic, right? In life, without a doubt, there is more than meets the eye. And, and an iceberg, without a doubt, is, is the perfect example because what we see naturally will be the top, but then we don't see the massive structure that an iceberg is under the water. Would you believe that in your life there is more than meets the eye today? That maybe you and I are seeing things but we're not seeing fully. That maybe you and I today, we're seeing the tip of it, but we don't know what's underneath it. And all of us here are going through trials, through tribulations and troubles. That's something we all have in common, especially being in a pandemic this whole past year and current. And uh, this reality that there's more than meets the eye knocked on the door of someone that I want to share the story with today. His name was Arthur. And Arthur had a friend, and his friend was called Bernie. And he's, no, 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 that's not the Bernie, guys. That is, that is the wrong Bernie. <laughs> like, what is wrong? This, guys, really? Like, good Lord. And this story is said on April 14th of 1978. And, and Arthur woke up that morning being grateful, you know, saying, like, man, I got a job, and it's all good in the hood. You know, it's, it's great. 
Uh, um, and he was waiting at, at the home after doing his, his morning, you know, uh, 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 routine. He, he got ready for work. Very, very thoughtful that morning. Very thoughtful. Like Arthur was like thoughtful. You know, when you wake up sometimes in the morning, it's like philosophical, right? He woke up super philosophical that morning saying, God is good, man. What a good, man, thank you. Thank you for the job I have. So all of a sudden, they knock on the door and it's his friend Bernie. And his friend Bernie was picking him up. Uh, April 14, 1978, and they get to work all together. But in the car ride, uh, Arthur was telling Bernie about how philosophical he woke up that morning. And I was like, like, Bernie, man, we have a good life, man, right? It's, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, it's like, we have a job. Yes, we do. Man, I'm so grateful that we have a, a you know, a, a sustainable income in our household. That's great. So they parked the car, got their lunch boxes, you know what I'm saying? And then they get off the car and they start walking to, to, to their job. Uh, they used to work in, in, in a place that did uh, house remodeling. And then they get into, into, into the office and the manager is waiting at the door. And he's like, good, good, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Manager. I don't remember the name of the manager. It's, it's okay. You know, it's like, uh, before you go into work today, I need you to step in into the office of the CEO. He's, he wants to have a kind conversation with you. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, you already know where we're going. And then they get into the office, and, and Arthur goes in first. And, I, you know, and then Bernie stays behind. And Bernie's, like, thinking what's going to go, what's happening, man? Oh, Lord, he, did, like, he was anxious, right? He's like, maybe, maybe, maybe we're going to get promoted, right? And he's there, and then all of a sudden, Arthur gets out of the office of the CEO, and he, it's like he's, like he's seen a ghost. He's like, <laughs> and in the moment, Bernie was about to ask him, Arthur, what happened? The manager says, the CEO is waiting for you. So they had no chance to have a conversation. So, so now Bernie sits down in the office and says, hey, uh, Bernie, Thank you for, for taking this, this short call meeting, but I have bad news for you. Unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. And they let him go. And then so Bernie gets out of the office, you know, bombed down, and, and then he meets uh, uh, Arthur and go like, yo, bro. And then they go off, and they're getting their stuff from their desks to get ready to go home, and they talk to each other and say, how is life like this? Like, we were just talking this morning. This man. We were talking to each other how great life is and that we have a job. And now we don't have a job. What are we going to do? But then in the moment of inspiration, Bernie says to Arthur, hold on a second. Arthur, I know what we're going to do. There, I know. Listen, it is time for us to start a business together. And Arthur said, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. And this is crazy. Because that happened April 14th, 1978. I don't want to miss the details here. On June 29th, a couple of months later, these two gentlemen, they went into the state of Delaware, and they registered their business that you and I can go into today, by the way, very easily. There's one over there at Pines. It's called the Home Depot. That's right, the Home Depot. And crazy thing is that a little bit over a year later, June 22nd, 1979, these two men, good old Bernie <laughs> and good old, um, thank you, you learned the name, Arthur. Jeez, I was going to say Mark because Arthur's last name is Mark. Anyways, uh, on June 22nd, 1979, in the state of Georgia, they opened their first two stores. The first two Home Depot opened on 1979. By the end of that year, by the end of that year, monthly in their stores, these people, this new company of these two laid-off workers in the industry was making $350,000 in revenues a month back in the day. Well, you say that's a lot of money. But by 1981, when they closed their accounts that year with so many open businesses that they had, they reached out $3 billion in revenues by 1981. You can say that might be a, su a successful business today in 2021. Imagine how successful it is if they were that successful in 1981. You know, for these two men, there was a reality. There was a check, a trial, a tribulation, a problem 
showed up at their doorstep. They had no job. But they said, you know what? I believe that in life there is more than meets the eye. And they said, in the midst of my trouble, in the midst of my storm, I will find an opportunity. And they did. And they did. For you and for me, that is our reality today. Trouble, tribulation, are, they're going to show up. They're going to knock on your door constantly. Maybe, actually, right now you're going through a problem in your life. But let me tell you, just like these two men, in your life there's more than meets the eye. Today I want to speak to you on this subject, beyond the fire. Why the fire? That's the best word I've found to grab tribulations and troubles, okay, and put them into one concept. So we're going to call our tribulation our problem. We're going to call it fire. Today I want to speak to you beyond the fire. Can you choose today to believe that in the midst of your situation today, there's more than meets the eye? Can you choose to go beyond the fire that you're living? Amen? Um, there's a story in the Bible, and I think that's going to help us because it has to do with fire, of course. We were just singing about it. Anybody loves that song? Yeah. There is another in the fire. Come on, guys. Let's sing it again. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's obviously a story. That song comes from a, a story in the Bible. Uh, there's four young men, really, that had to endure uh, slavery in a bit, bit different way, if I may. And uh, the Bible says that Babylon and his king Nebuchadnezzar, oh gosh, I practice it, Nebuchadnezzar, that's how you say it, right? Good Lord, uh, decided to invite, uh, in, invade, sorry, invade the the country of Israel and take them captives. And out of that um, a treasure that they took over from the land was, was actually people. The king chose and said, I need you to pick good, young looking people. I was wondering if I would have been picked that day. I just don't know. Um, I'm still wondering. Uh, and they did. And the story tells us about four young men, specifically uh, four young men that were very settled. They were, uh, some of them were royalty. They were, they were pretty hooked up, right? Okay. They were living the good life in Israel. And all of a sudden, a king from somewhere else comes into their land and ki literally kidnaps them in a way or like takes them uh, captive. And they start that journey to go into a very different land, a completely strange land for them and start living in the customs and whatever it was going to be presented by them. It, it, was, it, it was kind of like a weird thing because you're getting captive, but you have some privileges, but you're still captive. So you're a slave, but you're not living like slaves used to live. So it's like, there's like, I'm going to get the best out of you type of deal. I'm going to take you captive. I'm going to treat you well but I'm going to get the best out of you. And that's exactly what uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their friend Daniel uh, lived. And, you know, although their story is kind of like at a moment in the book of Daniel, they split up a little bit because they do. Um, it, it's kind of like a time frame thing in it. We just read, you know, uh, between the captivity of Israel and the exile to Babylon and Daniel's being thrown into the lion's pit is about 70-something years. So you already know that in between the story, we find these three young men that were starting to get in this weird and, and, and different land. They, they started to prosper, and they were doing good. They were doing good. They, they, they had favor, and they, and they started, like, being blessed in that society, in that culture. But then the king started working out some stuff, and, and you know, it's a different land, Different culture, they, they do different stuff. And all of a sudden, the king one day said, hey, listen, I'm going to build a statue. And the Bible describes the statue to be uh, somewhat like a 10-floor uh, building. So it's a big gold statue. Imagine the time they took. And uh, the king made a decree and said, hey, every single time, at this time of hour, when you hear all these instru instrument plays, you're going to have to bow down to the statue. So... The inauguration day came, literally, that they were going to do the first day, that they were going to play all the instruments. Everybody was there. Daniel wasn't there, by the way. The story says that he were, either he was sick or he was in assignment. We don't really know that. But his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were there. So by decree, they had to bow down to 
the statue, but they refused to do so. So some of the other officers that were there said, hey, 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 you got to bow down. And they said, we ain't bowing down. Hey, hey, you got to bow down. We're not doing it. Oh, you're not doing it? Then they go to Nebuchadnezzar and they say, hey, these three Israelites, they don't want to bow down. And he was so mad. He was so mad. He said, bring them in because there was um, a consequence if you wouldn't bow down. And he was that you will, you will be put to death by, by the furnace. <laughs> I don't know if you call that, but... It's not the furnace, the, the, the furnace, okay? They were, were going to throw you into a fire pit. That sounds better, right? A big fire pit, okay? So this man start interacting with the king. He's just like, listen, we're not going to do it. Oh, but you're going to die. Then we're going to die. Are you sure? Yes, we're going to die. Throw us in. He was so mad because he felt he was being defined that he said, hey, listen, the fire pit, you got to turn it up a little bit. Turn it up a notch. Seven times more. Seven times more hit. heat. Let's go heat. Seven. Did we win last night? I was being optimistic, right? It was the Nets. Gosh. But the Sixers beat the anyways. But seven times more, the heat. Whoa, the blazing fire. And the story says that these men were thrown into it. And it was so hot that the people that were thrown into died actually in the process of doing so. And this meets us this story right here in chapter uh, 3 of Daniel Verse 23, it reads like this, says, And these three men firmly tied, <laughs> it's so specific, they were firmly tied, okay, fell into the blazing furnace. Verse 24 says, The king Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his ad advisors, Wherein there are three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fort looks, looks like a son of the gods. Verse 26 says, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And if you keep reading the story, it says that they were unharmed, their clothes were not on fire, and they didn't even smell like smoke. I don't know if you're in a trial today, and I don't know if you're in a fire right now, but today I want to encourage you to look beyond the fire. What does that look for us? How does it look for us? How can you and I look beyond the fire? What would you and I find if we choose to look beyond the trial, to look beyond the furnace, to look beyond the pain that the fire is causing us? The first thing that I want to teach you today that I think is going to encourage us. The first thing you and I discover when we choose to see beyond the fire is that your fire is not forever. Your fire is not forever. I have seen people that have lost it in despair thinking that the problem they're going through and the tribulation and the trial is going to consume them. That is going to be forever. And you know what? Maybe what you're going through right now has taken forever. Or at least you feel like it. But my friend, let me remind you, God never gets there late. Never. Never. Never enough. Never. 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 God is never late. You and I must understand that the fire, it's a process. It's a process. And you know how you and I should embrace the process? I'll give you three things right now really quick. Take notes, by the way. If you're at home, take notes. The first thing we need to do in our lives, we got to accept the fire. We got to accept the fire. If your fire won't be forever, you need to know that you need to accept your fire. Number two, you got to assimilate the fire. And number three, you got to adapt to the fire. Listen to this. Accepting the fire. The definition of the word accept I love this, is consent to receive. Are you with me? Consent to receive. That means that you're sitting down and consciously you're saying yes. Yes. Yes to what? Yes, there is a fire. And yes, it's happening to me. If you don't accept the fire in your life, you won't be able to get out of it. The first thing we got to do is say the fire, it's there. And it's happening to me. And I think so many often times we get in that very toxic dynamic 
of not calling out the fires in our lives. Just figure it out. Imagine if your house will be on fire today. And you get there from work, you park your car, the house is like on flames. And you're like, oh my God, this is great. Maybe the AC broke, but whew, what a beautiful house I have. I like the, the tones of the colors, red, and I least see a little blue in the deep there. Your house is on fire. It's burning. And as long as you don't accept it, it's going to keep burning. We got to accept it. It's really happening, and it's really happening to you. And it is so hard. And that's why I stop here in this moment, because it, it's the beginning of everything. The fact that you realize, in the moment you re realize that you're in a toxic relationship, that you have not seen that before, it's going to hurt you. Because accepting the truth always hurts. But it's the only way to be healed. It hurts, but you'll be healed. In Jesus' name. Then he says we got to assimilate the fire. This means the, the definition of assimilate is to take in and understanding it fully. That's crazy. I accept it. There's a fire. My house is burning down. There's a problem in my house right now. There's a problem in my heart right now. But then I need to ask God to help me fully understand what's happening. What caused the fire? Why is the fire up? And why is it going away? We got to assimilate it. And number three, we got to adapt to the fire. This is, this is nuts. The definition of adapting is to make something suitable for a new use or purpose. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Make something suitable for a new use or for a new purpose. That is you telling your fire, not only I know you're here, not only I accept you, but I embrace you. Oh, but that burns, Pastor. Oh, yeah, it's going to burn. But you and I need to choose to adapt to the fire and say, that fire, that problem that I am going through right now that is hurting me so much has a purpose. And I'm going to find out what it is. And that takes us to point number two. What happens when I choose to look beyond the fire? Not only I will see that, that the fire is not forever, but you also discover that your fire burns, but your fire does not kill. Your fire burns, but your fire doesn't kill. I know it feels like it's going to kill you, but it's not going to kill you. Trust me. Trust me. There are different types of fires in our lives. And I want to talk to you really quick. I hope you're taking notes. Go over the purpose of the fire in your life. Every trial, every tribulation, every trouble has a hidden purpose in your life. It does, and the fire is there to reveal it. Your fire has purpose. I have to say that again. Everybody at home, your fire has purpose here you are your fire can reveal your fire can identify your fire can communicate and your fire can refine let's go through those really quick what do you mean that my fire my trial my test my problem can reveal something it can your fire can reveal what God has placed inside of you you have a God-given potential And the fire is the instrument that God uses to show you what you have inside. I heard this and I loved it. The fire shows the investment that God has placed in you. You care to God. Your life matters to God. And the fire, the trial, the trouble, the tribulation can showcase what God has placed inside of us. What is that thing? Number two, it says that the fire can identify. I love when you read in the Bible and you, you get to the story of Moses. And he is in front of the fire. There's a burning bush that does not consume. And the Bible says that the great I am is in there. And then Moses starts going like, uh, so what's going on? Like, who are you? <laughs> what's your name? And then the bush answers, I am. Uh, okay. Yeah, but what's your name? I am. 
yo, what's your name thing that you're, I am. Moses literally didn't know that as he was asking the bush who he was, his own identity was being revealed. Because God used the moment in the fire to reveal himself and then to reveal Moses who he was. I tell you, your fire identifies who you are. It's in the midst of your trial and your tribulation and your trouble when you see inside and everything is burned away, but you can see the core of you, who you are, a son and a daughter of God. Fire also communicates. You know why fire communicates? Because your story is worth it to be told. When you're going through fire in your life and you get to, to see beyond it, you're going to know that your story will communicate others of the grace, the love, and the wonder of Jesus. That when you're walking, I just got out of the fire, you know, and you're like getting off the ashes. That's going to tell somebody a story. And you're going to bring hope to people because you've been through the fire. And number four, fire refines. I love this. Because fire has the purpose to take away the things that are not supposed to be there. I wrote this. I love this. You might feel that the fire will consume you. But know that its purpose is not to consume you, but rather to consume something in you. That you get in the fire and things are being that God is dealing with stuff in your life. And you're going to get out of the fire with all the unnecessary baggage. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. It burns, but it doesn't kill. Because it has a purpose. Do you believe that today? I encourage you today to do two things as we start to close. Number one, put a name to your fire. Like I know it's like, oh, I have it. Oh, that's, that's great. But take a time this, this day or this week to sit down and write down the fire or fires that you might be going through right now. Identify it. Put a name to your fire. Second thing, once you know your fire and you are clearly identified it, write down or tell yourself, how does that fire make you feel? How does that fire make you feel? Put a name to your pain. This fire makes me feel like this. Maybe the fire of sickness has hit your house. Write it up. How does it make you feel? It makes me feel in despair. It makes me feel hopeless. And then when you know these things and you are aware of those things, bring them before God and someone that's next to you. Because here's the third thing. That you and I gain when we watch things and we choose to go beyond the fire. And is that you realize that your fire doesn't need to be a lonely place. Your fire does not need to be a lonely place because life was never meant to be lived alone. There's a fire. Might as well have someone in there. You've heard this before, but I'll repeat it to you. Hopefully you believe it. You are not alone. You are not alone, but you can choose to be alone though. You can, choose, you can identify your fire. You can know what it is. You can, you can start working on it, but know that there is no greater tragedy that for you and I to go through the fire and not learn a lesson. Because that thing's going to hurt. And you're going to stick with the pain and you're going to ditch the purpose. <laughs> How about if we heal the pain through God's love and we stick with the purpose? Bottom line is that that you can't do it by yourself. Now I know that God is with you and I know that. But you can still choose to ignore God. We can. You have yourself too, you can also choose to ignore yourself. And you got others in your life, but you probably also can choose to ignore them. So you can actually be in the furnace of fire by yourself. I wonder from our story today, these three men were not by themselves. They were friends. 
And if you see the whole context, they grew up together. They were enslaved together. They were promoted together. They were thrown in the fire together. Because it is key, it's imperative that you and I have a circle of people on our team. That when you're in the fire, when you're having doubts, when your faith is not being enough, you need someone next to you. A Shadrach, a Meshach, and a Abednego that says, hey, it's all right, man. Come on, stand up. We're really tied up here, but our God is going to save us in the middle of the furnace. Oh my goodness, that flame is getting too close. People are dying around us. I don't know if we're going to make it. Come on, man. We're going to make it. Don't worry about it. God is with us. And all of a sudden, yo, yo, guys, listen. Oh my God, that is Jesus right there in the middle of the fire. You got a group of people cheering you on. There's a concept that I love is the line of fire. Have you, like, when you see war movies, you're with me? And that is the space where you're going to die, <laughs> okay? That's the space where the, where the bullets and the bombs are, are going to. It's an effect. They're going to explode. The line of fire. Well, you might be there in the line of fire, but choose not to be alone in the, in the line of fire. If you're going to be there, might as well not be by yourself. God's going to place the right people. Just please identify those people. Be honest with those people. Be vulnerable with those people and stand. I wish I could bring you here on stage right now, but we're going to respect the, the stuff, right? The regulation. But imagine that there's people here, right here. There's a line of fire. You're taking the bullets of the process, of the pain that you're going through, but you are not alone. And on top of that, you have Jesus with you. Woo! Jesus is right there and he's flames all over the place. I love the fact that the story says they got in untied. I'm sorry. They got in the process, in the furnace, tied up, and they got out untied. Because the fire fulfilled its purpose. It freed them. I want to declare in Jesus' name right now that the fire that you're going through, the trouble, the trauma, the tribulation, that, that you're going through right now, after the process, after you step out of the furnace, God's going to set you free. And you're going to say, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. Come on, thank you, Jesus, for the fires. So I ask you to do a third thing, not just to write down and identify your fire and identify how it makes you feel, but I want you to do this week Write down, identify, tell yourself who's with me on the fire. Who's my line of fire? Who's right there fighting with me? Who's taking bullets for me and helping me out? Write it down. It's important for you to identify and you to choose. You can have 30 people in the line of fire. You can't do that. You know that. But choose the right people next to you. God has placed them there for you. Amen. Woo. Got to close. As a family this year, my family, my, my mom and dad, and my sisters, we went in through the furnace of fire. Back in the, back, uh, in the month of March, my, my little sister, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, if you've ever seen a picture of my sister, that's, that's her uh, after like two chemos or something like that in her process. But she had long hair, just like you. Not like me, but it's fine. Uh, Long hair, I can say I got a long beard, but long hair, beautiful hair. Oh, and you can only take pictures of my sister one sided only. Do anybody has one side for pic? Oh, gosh, okay, so it's a thing. All right, all right. She would not take a picture if not, it's her good side because her hair was like, you know. And we get the phone call say, Hey, she was her voice was broken. I remember it like it was yesterday. Says, I got cancer. <sighs> my dad was devastated. My mom was devastated. We couldn't travel. It was a pandemic. It was in March. And she had to go into the journey of six months of therapy and chemo in the middle of a pandemic. That's crazy, right? Maybe you've gone through right that. The fire of sickness knocked on my house. And he got in. And I remember 
that within the process we'll hear the news oh this broke uh, the needle was too harsh on her she needs to get a, a surgery so we could he was so, oh my goodness and I will ask her how are you doing how are you feeling and she crying she will say I feel terrible but I know God is with me she had to get into into the ER several times because the, it was so hard on her so hard on her and I will ask her hey how are you feeling and she will cry on the phone and send me messages I can't do this anymore but I know God is with me and she will constantly say I'll be y'all I'll be honest with everybody right now I would say like I wouldn't even believe it I was like it was so hard to hear her like that then even I was doubting what was going to happen with her process oh but thank God that she wasn't doubting she wasn't doubting and I will come to my senses and with Steph will continue pray with my family members believing of her healing. Well, you know what? She got her uh, final chemo in September. And uh, out of result, two months later in December, we got this picture coming up right here. And it says, I survived the pandemic and I defeated cancer. And the next picture is her giving a testimony in her church December 31st of this year. And she was giving testimony. If you know my sister, she's super shy. She would never do that in her life. But I'm telling you, you go in tied up into the fire and you get out free out of the fire. What God has done in her, she can do in you. She is free. The other day she called. And she says, I just saw a friend from high school. And what happened? She said, I, she just gave her life with Jesus, with me. And she said, this is the first time someone, I lead someone to the feet of Jesus. This was two weeks ago. Oh my God, as part of testimony as we close. She said this, I don't say thank you to God for the cancer. I don't. She said this, I'm quoting her. I don't thank God for the cancer. I thank God for the process though. Because it has made me someone new. I'm telling you, you might not like your fire. You might not like what you're going through right now, but I tell you, God's going to set you free. He's going to make you a new person. It's going to be a better version of yourself. Don't run away from the fire. Go right through the fire because you're not alone. God is with you and choose the right people to go through it with you. Go open a Home Depot, Jesus. We're going to close. Stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus. I declare every heart here and online, I declare your spirit is upon them, God. You're speaking to them. I declare that the revelation of the Holy Spirit, those hearts who are hardened and they don't want to see the fire, I pray, Holy Spirit, together as a family, that you can open their eyes today so that they can see the reality and be okay with it, that they can accept it, that they can assimilate it, and that, Father, they can join the process to adapt into the fire. God, I declare that every single one of my brothers and sisters right now receive the revelation that they are not alone. That in the midst of the furnace, in the midst of the fire, freedom is cooking. Come on, God. Their character is cooking. That you're doing great and mighty things in their lives in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on, if you believe that, praise the Lord. And maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you're online and you said, my goodness, I feel like I'm burning. God wants to refresh you today with the truth. That he has a water that will turn that fire down eternally. And today you can give your life to Jesus. How do I do that? The Bible says it's through a prayer that comes from the deepest of your heart. It's not just to repeat something. It's to say it from your heart. This prayer goes like this. And you can say it with me out loud and everybody in this place join me together and say, Jesus, today I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I need you. I believe that you are Jesus, the Son of God, my Savior, my Lord. I give you my past, I give you my present, and I give you my future. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and saving me amen and amen come on all over this place praise jesus the bible says that if you made that prayer you have begin you have begun your journey
of walking with Jesus. If you're online and that's your case, please let us know. There's part of our team on the chat right now. You can write down the name of Jesus. Just write Jesus and we'll get a hold of you. And if you're here, please, at the end of service, come close to us so that we can pray for you. Church, we love you. We'll see you next week and go practice this word throughout the week. Love you, church.